Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. This episode is brought to you by Element Electrolytes. This month, we are switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP Element partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive a free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link at drinkelementtcom slash carnivorecast. I'll provide it in the show notes as well. The Element sample pack includes one packet of every flavor. This is the perfect offer for anyone who's interested in trying all the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash carnworkcast to get this special offer and claim the deal. Element electrolytes are convenient, evidence-based, and delicious. They're used by Navy SEAL teams, Olympic weightlifters, jujitsu athletes, and everyday people who want to make themselves better like you and me. Dr. Stephen Hussey is a chiropractor, functional medicine practitioner, heart attack survivor, and type 1 diabetic. He's also the author of a new book, Understanding the Heart, Surprising Insights into the Evolutionary Origins of Heart Disease and Why It Matters, as well as the Health Evolution. Dr. Hussey was previously on the Carnivore Cast to talk about preventing heart attacks with a meat-heavy carnivore diet. Definitely check that one out for some 101 on heart disease, statins, cholesterol, fat for fuel for the heart, and more. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Scott. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, how have you been? What have you been up to? Um, well, uh, I, I really mainly uh, you know promoting the book and everything um, because I, I originally self-published the book. Um, but then it was picked up by a publisher. So we went back through the editing process again. And so it just came out in April. Um, so I've been working hard to, to kind of promote that. And um, and then also, um, you know, working hard to get speaking opportunities. So um, I'll be speaking at a, um, a few different events uh, later this year. So excited about that. But otherwise, just hanging out and, you know, uh, doing my clinical practice thing and and just having a good time. That's awesome. Well, um, you're a man of, of many accomplishments and you're doing a lot of great work. Um, so I, I wanted to hear, um, you know, it's a really interesting title, this evolutionary origins of heart disease. And I believe in some of the chapters you talk about, you know, the difference between us and other um, animals and how heart disease develops and how we may have um, perpetuated some of it. Can, can you get into that a little bit? And, and why did you decide to start with evolutionary origins? Yeah. So for me, you know, my first book is called the health evolution. And, um, I wrote that book because, you know, I, I've been kind of a student of, of health and how to create health for a very long time and I'll continue to be one forever, but it wasn't really until I kind of understood evolutionary principles that I started to understand, at least from my perspective, why we have chronic disease as a population and, um, and just seeing how, how things have so drastically changed in such a short amount of time and how there's no way that we can, um, we could have evolutionarily caught up with that as far as um, ad adapting to that evolutionarily. Um, and that's why, you know, we have illness. And so, you know, when I thought about this, this book on heart disease, um, I, I wanted to kind of help people understand the imbalances that I think create heart disease. And, and so the imbalances are happening in modern day, but those, those mechanisms in our body that, um, are still present in us today, you know, evolved in us a long time ago, um, very, very long time ago. Um, and even evolved in, even evolved in us before there was even an us before there was even modern humans. So I wanted people to kind of understand, um, those, um, I guess those, those roots, uh, that heart disease holds, um, so that, uh, they can fully understand like why it's happening because me understanding why is the key to understanding what to do about it. So, uh, in the first part of the book, I kind of go through the history of not just humans, but the history of, of life on earth, um, uh, and, and, and stop at certain phases or certain times in that history of life, where I think that very key mechanisms evolved in, in our physiology that, that, um, predisposes to heart disease today within our modern society. Very interesting. And how do we differ from other animals when it comes to heart disease and heart attacks? Yeah. So, 
there's this one point in in the evolution of of life where we get the reptiles um evolving into the first mammals um and this happened um I believe I, I may mis misquote the number, but I think it's 225 million years ago when we saw the first mammals. And, um, and so there's this very different, um, and people have heard the term like play dead, um, when it comes to certain animals, animals play dead or whatever. And that's actually kind of a, a real thing based on, um, uh, certain animals, um, adapt or adaptation response to a stress. Um, and so mainly like in reptiles, you know, reptiles think of them as like these, these cold blooded animals, um, so they don't, the reason they're cold blooded and the reason that a mammal is warm blooded is because, um, is because the mammals are much more metabolically active. We're, we're constantly making energy all the time because we're very, um, uh, mammals at least are very, um, uh, very active. They're always moving around. They make quick movements. Um, that kind of thing. They create body heat because we're producing all this energy all the time. Whereas reptiles tend to be more slower moving, you know, um, and they, they don't have, some of them have these kind of bursts of speed, but they're not like moving around all the time. And so they can kind of suppress their metabolism to a point uh, during a stress that they can actually shut down an organ. Um, and, and this is what, you know, this, this idea of playing dead. Um, and for some reason that was evolutionarily advantageous. It's almost like it created a lack of interest in the predator that was, you know, um, preying on them. And, uh, so when they had this shut down response, they literally played dead and organs literally shut down. Now, if a stress response like that happened in a mammal and the reaction was for an organ to shut down, that would be a very problematic thing because we're very metabolically active. We need constant energy. There's no way we could survive for a period of time with a shut down organ. There's actually very few species uh, of mammal, um, only really one that I know, which is the naked mole rat that, that can severely slow their metabolism and almost shut down um, organs. But that's because they've evolved that in a very specific um, circumstance. But in, in general, um, if that happened in mammals, then, uh, then we'd have, we'd have a, uh, organ death or, or, or death of the, the mammal in general. And so in order for a mammal to evolve into a, um, or, a, or sorry, reptile to evolve into a mammal, um, or for that process to take place over however many thousands, millions of years, um, we had to have a change in the stress response because we, we could no longer have a stress response that related or created organ shutdown. And so that's what we see. We see that in reptiles, um, there was this one pathway of of the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that um, that uh, communicates our stress response, um, and it was the the dorsal motor, motor nucleus. Um, and so, then in higher evolved reptiles, we start to see this this evolution of this split uh, in that nerve. So there was two different pathways, and then in mammals, it's fully evolved into two different pathways. So there's one nerve, uh, the vagus nerve, has two different pathways: the dorsal motor nucleus and the nucleus ambiguous. And so this this other pathway almost allows for us to have that stress response without an organ shutdown. Um, and, and so that's what allowed mammals to have, you know, responses to stresses and still not die and still not, and have that, that problematic situation. And so, you know, hopefully people are starting to think, you know, cause you kind of preface this with, you know, heart attack. Um, there is a situation where we can, we can have a stress response when we have a severely imbalanced stress response that can, um, that can kind of default us back to that older evolved um, kind of reptilian response. Um, and that can cause um, shifts in metabolism in the heart um, where it forces the heart to burn more glucose than it would like to. Um, and that can lead to a cascade of changes that can cause to what I've termed metabolic heart attacks because of the shift in metabolism. And we see this a lot, you know, way more prevalent than, than we think. Uh, Cause most people think this heart attacks cause are caused by a blockage of an artery in the coronary arteries, which can happen. Um, but, um, more often than we think it, it, it's caused by the shift in metabolism when there's no blockage whatsoever. Um, but we still get tissue death of, of, uh, of heart tissue. And, uh, it's due to these mechanisms of this, um, of metabolism and a forced shift in metabolism due to a imbalanced stress response and then a stressful event happening. Yeah. Can we take a little bit? That's fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Can we talk a little bit more about, um, the real causes and what may cause atherosclerosis and um, other problems with the heart. Yeah. So, you know, when people say heart disease, um, we kind of categorize or I kind of categorize it into two or three different uh, categories. And so that is like atherosclerosis, which is like hardening of the arteries, um, which everybody talks about cholesterol with that. Um, and then there's heart failure um, where the heart is quote unquote, not pumping like it should be, but 
it's not necessarily supposed to be pumping, which we can talk about. Um, and then there's heart attacks, um, or, or, um, I guess, um, yeah, cause you could do heart attacks or you could do, um, cardiac arrest, th those types of things. There's different types of heart attacks. Um, but, but yeah, so if you want to talk about, I believe, you know, in my book, there's this theme of these three imbalances that I trace back evolutionarily. Um, these three imbalances that happen within our modern society to our bodies that, um, that predisposes to heart attacks. And those are, um, having poor metabolic health, uh, which is kind of a, a buzzword right now, um, metabolic health or, um, you know, being insulin resistant would be poor metabolic health, um, and having, you know, poor metabolic flexibility, the ability to, to go back and forth easily from burning uh, carbohydrates and fatty acids readily. Um, the second imbalance is inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, um, cause they kind of go hand in hand in, in my world. Um, some people can differentiate them because they're, they're kind of two different things. Um, but they can they cause the same kind of issues in the body. So I kind of lump them together and a lot of the same things cause those two things. So I, I lump oxidative stress and inflammation together. Um, and these are, these are, um, situations in the body where we're constantly telling the body to have an inflammatory response. And so it's a state of inflammation or we're getting an excess of what are called free radicals in the body, um, which, um, I tell people those are kind of like the Looney Tunes, Tasmanian devil, where they're just kind of going around looking for things to do and causing damage in the process. Um, and, uh, we can get to states where, where that kind of stuff happens. And then, um, the third one is an imbalance in our autonomic nervous system, which uh, the autonomic nervous system is a system in our body that's perceiving our environment through our senses and telling our body whether we're in a safe or threatening situation. And based on which one we we're in, our body responds accordingly. However, we can get an imbalance in this response and we can incorrectly think that we're constantly in a, in a, a threatening state. Um, and that can lead to an imbalance. Like a, a, we're always in this, this stress response state, um, which can cause a, a lot of issues. Um, so those, those three imbalances are, I think, the drivers of, of, um, of heart disease um, these three types of heart disease. And so, you know, we can get into how those specifically cause atherosclerosis or whatever, if you want to, but I'll, I'll let you kind of ask from there. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Those three types and where, I guess, what, how does um, like ventricular hypertrophy fit into these things? Like the heart enlarging, does that lead to one of these different types of um, heart disease or how does that play into this whole situation? Yeah. So, I mean, like when the, when the heart expands like that, I guess you, you're calling it, you know, like um, um, cardiomyopathy um, or um, dilated cardiomyopathy where, you know, the heart is kind of like at least one end of it anyways, it's kind of shaped like a football. It's kind of kind of that comes to that point a little bit because it's supposed to be spiraling when it contracts and everything. But um, in uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, Yes, a, ventri a, a ventricle can expand, you know, and it, and it can be shaped more like a basketball um, or one end of the heart can be shaped more like that. Um, and to me, this happens for a few reasons. One, um, we can get inefficient metabolism of the heart um, because it's been shown over and over again that the heart tissue prefers fatty acids and ketones for fuel. Um, and that even in the presence of glucose, that the heart will go for the ketones for sure. Um, it just has a preference for those things. And I think that's, I, I, I think, um, I theorize that that's because, um, it has to be a very metabolically efficient tissue because it's constantly contracting, um, and it doesn't stop our whole life. Um, and so if we were, if we were, um, burning a, a more inefficient fuel more readily, like, like carbohydrate or like glucose, um, that could lead to issues, um, in that area. So it has this preference for fatty acids and ketones. And so, however, there are situations where, you know, um, the, the heart can be forced to burn more glucose than we, than we want it to. And, um, and that, you know, that can come from, you know, a high stress response or being, um, metabolically inflexible, um, from eating, you know, vegetable oils and, and, um, and higher carbohydrate processed carbohydrate foods and things like that for, for a while. Um, and so that, that kind of stuff can predispose us to heart failure because now we get this inefficient, um, contracting muscle. Um, and so it, the heart, it, it's really not designed to be this pressure propulsion pump that, that, that moves the blood throughout the whole body. And, um, it, it actually physically can't do that based on, you know, the physics of it, uh, and the, and, and like the engineering of it, like it's, it's impossible for a heart that size to do that. Um, heart, our size, 
to do that. And, um, and so if it's forced to, um, because it has this poor energy source or burning more glucose than it wants to, but also when there's a breakdown of mechanisms of, of blood flow on its own, um, then the heart can be forced to be more of a pressure propulsion pump than it's designed to be, or that it's evolved to be. And, um, and that can create this dilation, uh, of, of a ventricle or both ventricles or one entire side of the heart. Um, and that leads to, um, poor, poor function because blood doesn't move through the heart as efficiently when that happens. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of, um, multiple things, you know, it's, it's these breakdowns of mechanisms of the blood moving on its own, forcing the heart to move it more, but also we get a poor metabolism. And curiously enough, like hearts in heart failure, when they study people who with heart failure, um, they really prefer ketones. Like not only does a, um, uh, normal heart tissue prefer ketones and fatty acids, um, but the preferred fuel source for the heart, a failing heart is ketones, um, hands down. Um, and they've seen this over and over and over again in studies. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so what are what are some of the other, you mentioned the three types. Um, what are some of the other causes that can lead to those and how do they manifest? Oh, uh, you mean like atherosclerosis or heart attacks? Yeah. Yeah. So like with atherosclerosis, you know, everybody talks about, so atherosclerosis is the hardening of the arteries. Um, and it's going to happen. It happens very um, uh, predominantly in coronary arteries, but can it can happen in many different arteries. Um, and so like, I like to ask people a few questions, you know, like, you know, cause people say, oh, it's cholesterol or, you know, I guess the mainstream um, medicine says it's cholesterol or the conventional wisdom is that it's high cholesterol causes these, these things. And, but I would ask people, you know, if, if cholesterol is the driver of atherosclerosis and when you have high cholesterol, it's high everywhere in the blood, not just where you're getting atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis then why does an atherosclerosis develop everywhere? You know, why is it only in these select places? If if cholesterol is the driving force. And also why doesn't it happen in veins? Um, why don't veins get atherosclerosis? And, you know, the, the short answer is, is that, um, you know, the artery arteries are under higher pressure. Um, but that doesn't mean that that cholesterol is causing, um, atherosclerosis. So if we look at what atherosclerosis is, is, is this, it's hardening of the arteries because, you know, the lining of the arteries is called the endothelia. There's these endothelial cells that line the arteries and, you know, there's always blood flowing through there. And so anytime there's something flowing past something, there's going to be normal wear and tear. There's going to be damage. Um, that's, that's just like a natural part of life. There's going to be wear and tear. Um, it's the ability of our body to repair that, that normal wear and tear that's important. And so when we look at the endothelial cells, and what they need um, to repair themselves from this normal wear and tear, it's it's uh, insulin signaling. It's the signal that insulin gives it for growth and repair. Um, and so, I mean, that's what all tissues, I mean, that's what insulin does. It's a main thing that it does is it signals um, growth and repair. Um, it also, you know, allows um, uh, glucose into the cells and things like that. Um, but you know, it does a lot of other things too, but, um, but uh, it, growth and repair is a, is a main role of it. And so if we're in a, a state where we're insulin resistant, we have poor metabolic health, um, then that insulin signaling is not happening very well. And so then what happens if we get this normal wear and tear or we get excessive wear and tear because we're not living a, a healthy lifestyle, you know, um, we're exposed to toxins, we have high stress, we're eating an inflammatory diet, like those types of things, we're getting more wear and tear, we're getting more damage to these arteries and they have an inability to repair themselves because they lack insulin signaling because they're insulin resistant. and what happens in that case is the body says, well, we have to do something because if we don't do anything, the artery is going to rupture. And that's a much bigger problem. That's bleeding out. You know, that's, that's death pretty quickly. Um, and so it, it uses, um, it uses cholesterol and minerals and various other things to almost like spackle uh, to kind of patch up this artery um, that's, that's being damaged. Um, you know, it's just kind of a short-term fix, um, you know, that's better than the alternative, you know, and so, and then we get this development of atherosclerosis. And if that process keeps happening, then the atherosclerosis gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and so, but since cholesterol is part of that process, it's kind of been blamed for, um, for the development of atherosclerosis. And, and, you know, people will tell me too, like, well, it's not just, it's not cholesterol. We understand that doesn't do it, but it's, it's, but if it's damaged cholesterol, like oxidized cholesterol or LP little A or, or, or things like that 
then those things cause it. And yes, they do contribute, but those, those things in my mind are still not at fault. Um, the high amounts of those things can contribute to atherosclerosis, contribute to that damage of the lining of the artery because those things are acting like free radicals, just like everything else um, that, that can act like a free radical. However, it's the things that cause the oxidized LDL, that cause the damage to the cholesterol that are also causing damage to the lining of the artery. Those are the things that are driving the, the atherosclerosis formation because of the damage it's creating. And so ox- our, our atherosclerosis is, is these two things that I talk about. It's this inflammation and oxidative stress damaging the lining of the artery. But then it's the inability of the body to repair itself because we're metabolically, we're, we have poor metabolic health that really allows the process to take place and, and kind of take off. Um, uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore and their new Brain Nourish. Brain Nourish is the ultimate whole food nootropic supplement to build a better brain. They've combined grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane powder in a groundbreaking formula. These two ancestral superfoods have been used for centuries as a nootropic to improve brain function and overall mental well-being. Now available for the first time together in convenient capsules. You can get 10% off your order by going to the link in the podcast notes or in my Instagram bio and using the code carnivore10, all one word, at checkout. Each serving has 1,500 milligrams of organic lion's mane mushroom extract and 1,500 milligrams of beef brain. They only use 100% real mushrooms, organic fruit bodies, which are rigorously tested and for active compounds. The beef brain is sourced from the highest quality regenerative farms in New Zealand. Check out the link in my bio or in the show notes to get yours today. So how how can we prevent some of this? Um, what are some, some things that we can do to improve our heart health? How can we get ahead of it? Um, and then I'd, I'd love to also get your take on like preventative testing and, and uh, mm. something better than just a simple lipid profile. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so you so in the book, I you know I talk about these three imbalances, and it's kind of a theme throughout the book. And so um, when we talk about how do we how to prevent heart disease, it's how do we how do we create um, health in these three, or how do we prevent these three imbalances and create balance with these? And so the three imbalances we'll go through it, it's the poor metabolic health. So the things that are driving, I think, poor metabolic health. Um, uh, from a dietary perspective are vegetable oils because the way your body metabolizes vegetable oils or high amounts of omega-6 fatty acids, linoleic acids, um, or polyunsaturated fatty acids, whatever you want to call them. Um, the way your body metabolizes those tells the body, uh, it tells the fat cells to be insulin sensitive and it tells the rest of the body in turn to be insulin resistant. And when the rest of the body is insulin resistant, that's that's the problem where we get the insulin resistance of the endothelial cells. And so it's the, it's the, the large consumption or the increased consumption of vegetable oils that we've seen over the last hundred years or so, um, that is driving that, but then all the processed carbohydrate foods, um, the grains and the, and the sugars and things like that, um, are basically fuel to the fire. The only thing worse than breaking your metabolism is, is trying to get it to work properly when it is broken. And so that's exactly what all the processed carbohydrates do. Um, and I think that, you know, um, you, you could also create a state of insulin resistance with enough processed carbohydrates, um, um, but not as bad as if there were vegetable oils too. So that's, you know, dietarily, that's how we're getting metabolically inflexible. And so if you want to avoid it from a dietary standpoint, you, you avoid those foods. Um, but also, I mean, insulin resistance can be caused by many different things. I mean, chronic stress, uh, will definitely do it. Um, and, uh, or toxin exposure, things like that. Certain toxins will definitely contribute to that as well. So it's, it's always, it's never one thing that causes these imbalances. Um, when we talk about, um, inflammation and oxidative stress, um, you know, eating an inflammatory diet is, is obviously one thing, um, that's going to cause not just the inflammatory response, but also oxidative stress, especially the, again, back to the vegetable oils. Um, you know, those, lots of those are already, um, rancid and and oxidized when we eat them, um, because they've been heated or whatever. And so that's just going to contribute to the state of inflammation, um, and these free radicals that are in the body. So, you know, poor diet for sure. Um, I would say 
lack of collagen protein uh, is is one reason we can get oxidative stress because coll- the the amino acids in collagen protein um, are um, well, there's specific amino acids that are higher in collagen protein that are um, the building blocks for you know encouraging your body to make its own antioxidants, which are going to combat those free radicals um, that create oxidative stress. So um, collagen is is a big thing there. Um, and then hormetic stresses will also increase, um, you know, your body's, um, ability to make, um, uh, antioxidants. So my favorite hormetic stresses are like infrared sauna or exercise or, um, you know, hot, cold therapy, those types of things, you know, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, um, and then also toxin exposure. So the areas I tell people to look into their life as far as toxin exposure and try to minimize their toxin exposure are, um, our food, which we kind of talked about already. So, you know, you know, organic doesn't mean that it's completely, you know, void of toxins, but it's way less than, um, if it wasn't organic. So I, I would try and do that and just know where your food comes from. Um, there's water. So make sure you're drinking clean water. Um, you know, ideally not in plastic bottles and not tap water and just kind of get the cleanest, um, water you can get, which can be a chore these days. Um, it's, uh, air. So obviously we can't control all the air that we breathe because when we go outside, but we can't control the air in our home to an extent, um, especially in our bedroom where we spend a third of our lives. I really think it's important to, um, to, um, filter the the air, uh, get a good filter, um, for the air in your, in your bedroom. Definitely make sure there's no mold in your ho- home and things like that. Uh, and then, Cosmetics, uh, anything you put on your skin is going to get in your body. So make sure you're limiting the toxin exposure there. And then cleaning products, anything you're cleaning your home with, um, make sure it's the cleanest as possible as far as like no toxins um, so that we're not getting exposed there. So, um, I mean, toxin exposure can be a huge source of oxidative stress and inflammation. So pay attention to that. Um, And then as far as balance in the autonomic nervous system, um, like I said, this is a system that's perceiving our environment and telling us we're in a safe or threatening situation. So we want to do things. Um, that help, you know, our body, body consciously or unconsciously think that it's in a safe place so that we can get this balance and the stress response. And so, you know, there's all the, there's all the different things that, you know, people talk about often that help create balance or stimulate the vagus nerve, stimulate parasympathetic activity um, that creates that balance. And those are things like meditation or positive social loving relationships, um, nature exposure, um, sunshine, like these types of things uh, yoga, that, that type of stuff. Um, and all those things are great and they definitely help create balance, but I also want to make sure people are trying to identify and eliminate the things that are creating imbalance, the things that are making us feel stressed out. And so, you know, humans are interesting creatures. Um, like we talked, we talked about that evolution of the stress response from, from reptiles to mammals. And then humans take it even a step further because we're even more different because we're the only species that can think our way into a stress response. Um, you know, we can literally have, um, something stressful happen across the world, see it on the news and stress out about it and think our way into a stress response or have something stressful actually happen to us. And instead of being over it pretty quickly, we could be traumatized by it and it keep coming back and re-traumatizing us over and over again and get us into this perpetual state of a stress response, um, because of our, you know, large brains that we can, we can think this way, um, to say that it's a bad thing because our, our large brains have gotten us you know, really far in, in the world, but, um, but it, 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 we have to take that into account too. Um, and so we also want to remove those things that create this imbalance and a stress response. And, and what I tell people is that, it, you know, cause you can say, oh, this stresses me out or whatever, but the things that seem to stress us out the most and cause, uh, it seem to result in poor health outcomes are the stresses that make us feel like we're out of control or make us feel like we're in an unpredictable situation. Um, and so they did a study in, with people in a, in a big company and they found that the people, um, like people at the top of the company, people at the bottom of the company, um, on, like on the totem pole in the company, like reported the same amounts of stress. Um, and the people who were at the bottom of the company who didn't have control over their pay or their work hours or job security or things like that, um, had way worse health outcomes than those in the higher ups in the company who, reported just as much stress, but had more control of that stress. Their stress was coming from their demanding schedule that they controlled, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's, uh, if you look into your life, 
and look at what to eliminate. It's try and find those stresses that are making you feel out of control or that you're, you can't predict what's coming. And, and those are the big ones. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I found, uh, in my own life, the things that stressed me out the most were like back when I was traveling and just, you know, flying on airplanes every week and couldn't control, you know, delays. You, you feel like you're completely at the mercy of someone else um, and completely helpless in some of those situations. It's so stressful. Yeah. Um, how about uh, blood donation or bloodletting? Does that relieve stress on the heart? Can that help prevent heart disease? Um. I've never really looked into that, but I would, I would speculate. No, uh, I, I, um, so a, a big thing that we haven't quite talked about is that the heart is, is, is actually not the main mover of the blood in the body. It's actually, um, it's not this pressure propulsion pump that forcefully brings in fluid from one area and pushes it out somewhere else forcefully. It, that's not quite how it works. And, like when we look at the size of the heart and if it would be even able to act as a pressure propulsion pump and deliver blood throughout the entire body, it actually wouldn't. It just, it's, it's like um, impossible for the heart that size to be able to do that. So there are mechanisms within the blood, um, which is has to do with this formation of fourth phase water because half the, half the blood is water. Um, this formation of fourth phase water on the lining of the artery that actually creates blood flow. And they've shown this over and over again uh, in Dr. Jerry Pollock's lab. And um, there's been experiments throughout you know, the last half century that have shown that the blood does indeed move on its own without a pumping heart or without a contracting heart. I don't say contracting, which is not really pumping. Um, I mean, the heart does do a little bit of pumping, but it's no more pumping than just enough to get the blood through the chambers of the heart, really, and maybe through some of the bigger arteries. But um, so it. So the, the heart actually functions. So with the, with the blood already flowing, um, if we look at another device within the world of like engineering um, that operates like that, the hydraulic ram operates like that. So the hydraulic ram is this sort of, you know, quote unquote pump um, that operates only by um, when, when, when fluid is flowing into it already. So usually water's flowing from higher up, like a reservoir coming down um, into the hydraulic ram. And um and so it's it's flow operated, and so the the flow uh, that's coming from the arteries and the veins back to the heart, um, or just from, just the veins back to the heart, um, creates this hydraulic ram type situation. And, and in my book, I I kind of uh, highlight or I label the analogous structures between a hydraulic ram and the heart, and I show how this this takes place. And um, and so you know, back to your question, um, would bloodletting um, be helpful with that. I would, I would say no, because, because a hydraulic ram, one of the things that's, um, uh, necessary, uh, I think for it to be functioning is enough pressure in the system, um, which is why hydration is really important. Um, we want to make sure there's enough blood creating enough pl- pressure, um, to maintain pressure between the two systems, arteries, arteries and the veins, um, and make sure the hydraulic ram is functioning properly as it should be, uh, keeping flow moving to that. Uh, to the heart um, uh, through these mechanisms of fourth phase water in the heart. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and why, um, we may not know the answer, but why do you think men have such higher rates of heart disease than women? Um, I, I think that, I think part of it probably has to do with, um, well, I mean, first of all, I think that men just kind of, uh, Lots of men, at least, don't necessarily pay attention to their health as much as women do. Uh, women are like women historically have been like the caretakers of the family, and um, they seem more interested in taking care uh, of, of the family. What's going to keep the family healthy? Uh, though lots of men are like that too. Um, with the with the men, we're just kind of like the we're just going to go do this, do whatever I need to do to make the money or or provide for the family, however that may be. Now, traditional roles like that, I hope people nobody's offended by that, but like that's traditionally how it's been. However, women are catching up. Um, if we look at the numbers, women are definitely catching up. And I think that's because, um, uh, some of those changes, but I, I also think that, um, maybe one, one interesting reason is that, so when I look at these three imbalances, uh, and I talk about this in my book, when it comes to heart attacks, um, we look at these imbalances, the third one, the, the autonomic nervous system imbalance, 
um, you know, a, a creating balance in that uh, can be done lots of different ways. And it's actually been shown that a monthly cycle, a menstrual cycle, um, has been shown to significantly increase um, the amount of parasympathetic of non-stress signaling to in the autonomic nervous system, which creates balance. And that's something that obviously women have that men don't have. Um, they don't have that that monthly parasympathetic stimulation uh, that women have. So that can be one explanation. Um, uh, but uh, but but yeah, I mean, th- there could be many different reasons. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing, but it's also interesting that women are definitely catching up as far as heart disease goes. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, and what about uh, heart cancer? Um, how, what does that have to do with this? And, and what do you think about heart cancer? Yeah, so this was a, a question that was posed to me maybe three or four years now ago now. And um, and I immediately kind of, I guess, speculated what the answer was. And I did some research and found out my my real answer. But the, yeah, the heart, um, it, heart cancer is extremely rare. Um, and, you know, so just to give people uh, an idea, like, well, not only is heart cancer itself rare, but a primary tumor where like the cancer starts in the heart is, a, is even more rare than heart cancer itself. Um, but there's a guy in Canada, I think he's in Canada, a doctor in Canada, who's kind of the, the closest thing that we even have to a cardiac oncologist. And he only really sees like 10 to 12 cases a year. And usually those are from um, cancer metastasizing from somewhere else in the body to the heart. Um, they didn't originate in the heart. So heart cancer is this extremely rare thing. Yet cancer rates are rising like crazy, but heart cancer still stays pretty rare. And so um, I think there are two reasons uh, for this. Um, one is that, like I kind of talked about before, like the metabolism of the heart, um, it, it prefers fatty acids and ketones. And if people are familiar with the work of um, Dr. Otto Warburg, and then more recently, Thomas Seafried and Dominic D'Arstino, uh, and how they, uh, the metabolic theory of cancer and these types of things, um, ketones, um, are, are, are non-fermentable fuels. And when you look at like a, a cancer, what cancer is, it's when the cell has become so damaged that it can't use oxygen anymore, um, to make energy. And it has to result, instead of using oxidative phosphorylation, it has to use something called fermentation. Um, and so, these, you know, ketones are literally non-fermentable fuel sources. And so the heart has this preference for ketones. Um, and so, um, just that by default would suggest that, uh, the heart is less likely to use a fuel, um, that would create this, this state where we get this acidic, um, you know, non-differentiated, you know, very uh, poorly structured cell that is a cancer cell. Um, but also I guess the, the main reason is that heart cells can't divide. Um, they somewhere along the developmental path, they lose the ability to divide, which means that if you damage heart cells, um, repair is the only option you have. You cannot make new ones and replace that tissue like like lots of other tissues in the body can. Um, they can they can divide and grow more tissue, whereas the heart. Um, that's, that's why heart attacks are such a big deal because if tissue in the, the heart is damaged, the only chance we have is to repair those damaged cells. Um, we can't make new ones. And so, um, you know, I, I, I talked about that situation where we could get a heart attack where there's an imbalance in the, the stress response and that forces the shift in metabolism in the heart. Um, and that shift in metabolism is, is the shift toward glucose utilization, which is the same thing we see in cancer is glucose utilization because glucose is the fermentable fuel that the, the cancer cells can use, which is why you, which is why, uh, um, you take a solution of glucose and do the DEXA scan and that picks up the cancer spots, wherever the glucose is being more utilized, you can pick up the cancer spots on that scan. Um, and so, so if, uh, if, um, if the situation happens where we get the surgeon adrenaline and, and the, the heart is, you know, forced to burn more glucose than it's designed to, or evolved to burn, um, when, since the heart cells can't track can, or can't, um, divide, uh, they die. Right. So that's why we can get metabolic heart attacks is because in that situation, um, where we're forcing the, the heart to burn more glucose than we want to, instead of become a cancer cell, that's this rapidly dividing kind of short-term fix, long-term issue, because that's all cancer is, is the survival mechanism of the cell to rapidly divide um, uh, to prevent, or because it's, it's, it's like a short-term fix, but long-term, it's obviously not a good thing. Um, 
heart cells can't do this because they can't divide, so they die. Um, so instead of becoming cancerous, um, they just die, which is why heart cancer is so rare. Interesting. And um, I want to talk about uh, preventative screening. Um, typically, you know, your average GP will, will only look at a basic lipid profile. Um, can you talk about some of the problems with that and, you know, what you would suggest instead, both um, whether it's in terms of uh, blood work as well as imaging? Definitely. Um, yeah, so the problem with taking just a lipid panel and looking at your total cholesterol or your LDL cholesterol is that um, cholesterol by itself, it, it, there's no really evidence that it, it it causes heart disease as far as atherosclerosis goes. And there's lots of studies um, that show that people with higher cholesterol live longer, have less heart disease, less cancer, uh, higher cognitive abilities as they age, this kind of stuff, less infection. Um, at least the associations are there. I mean, those are only association studies, but um, you'd think that if cholesterol was this problem, I think we'd at least see an association between higher cholesterol and these things. Instead, we see the opposite. Um, and so when uh, when we think about it that way, um, there's also studies that show that um, there's this one study, um, I think it was in 2009, where they looked at all the heart attacks that happened in, in about 60% of the hospitals um, in the United States. Um, and they took cholesterol levels within 24 hours of someone being admitted for a heart attack. And they found that I think over 75% of them had uh, normal, quote unquote, normal cholesterol levels. Um, so and I know cholesterol fluctuates, you know, Dave Feldman has showed us that, that it definitely fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, you'd think that um, if cholesterol, high cholesterol was so causative in heart attacks and atherosclerosis that you did at least see more than 25% of the people with high cholesterol who had heart attacks, right? Um, so the things just don't match up, but, um, again, we, we're kind of, you know, blaming this thing that is used to repair the lining of the artery in certain situations as the cause for atherosclerosis. So what really, what should we really be looking at if, if cholesterol is not, um, so, um, uh, problematic and it's not really the cause. So I still would want to take a lipid panel. However, I wouldn't be so worried about the total cholesterol in the, in the LDL. I'd look at the triglycerides. Uh, and the HDL, and I do the trig to HDL ratio, and that that number should be that ratio should be 1.5 or lower. Um, that's going to tell me more about your metabolic health and risk for atherosclerosis than than just looking at you know cholesterol it, itself, um, total cholesterol or or LDL. Um, you could also look at you know oxidized LDL or LP little 80s kind of things like that, and. And I, I, I like to, you can look at those. I don't like to put so much emphasis on those though, because again, it's not the thing, it's not those things themselves that are directly causing, or the only things that are directly causing atherosclerosis It's the things that create those things that the, the things that damage that cholesterol that make oxidized LDL that are also damaged in the line of the artery. Those are the things like the toxin exposure, the stress, the poor food, the things we talked about. Um, so looking at that and then the other best marker of, of metabolic health, the trig to HDL ratio is one. The other is like just a fasting insulin, this blood sugar kind of regulation. And the fasting insulin is really important because, you know, you could be insulin resistant for years because you're using more insulin to keep your blood sugars normal um, um, and, and not be quote unquote diabetic yet. But you have to take the fasting insulin to figure that out. Um, because if you wait till you're diabetic, and you've been insulin resistant because you have a high fasting insulin for 10 years before that, there's been damage happening for those 10 years and we didn't intervene. So that's a really important number for metabolic health. And then um, as far as inflammation and oxidative stress, I mean, you could take a lot of different numbers um, to really get into the weeds, um, you know, measuring damage to DNA or damage to you know, fatty acids in the body. But I think there's generally a good place to start is like a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is a good measure of general inflammation in the body. And then uh, I like to take a GGT, which is a liver enzyme that kind of gives me an assessment of how um, how much oxidative stress is the liver having to handle. Um, I think those are good places there. And then as far as balance in the autonomic nervous system, um, the best measure of balance in the autonomic nervous system is heart rate variability, um, which, you know, there's no mistake that we measure that that through something in the heart um, because the heart is very connected to our emotional state. Um, and that's why we say things like, I love you with all my heart. So um, heart rate variability, uh, incredibly important to be tracking as far as this goes. And then, you know, uh, one that people like to look at is the, 
is a CAC score, um, coronary artery calcium score. Um, and that's like, like a CT scan of, of the coronary arteries to basically assess if there's um, calcification in the arteries. So the thing, the issue with this though, is, I mean, it's a good scan. It's definitely um, good to, to look at um, as far as assessing risk, but it doesn't show soft plaques. It only shows the hard plaques, like the ones that have calcified, because those are, that's what's going to show up on the CT. So if there's soft plaques around and there's a lot of them, you're not necessarily going to know. Um, also, it's really hard to take that because I've, I've had clients come to me and say that, you know, they, they're like, I, I went and I, I wanted to change my lifestyle and change everything. And I did everything right. I did. Um, and they did like, it sounds like they did a lot of the right things, you know? And they said, I got a CAC score and it was, it was 400 or something like that. And I was, and they're just like, why is it so high? I, I don't understand. I've been doing it right. I said, well, how do you know it wasn't 800 before, you know? So it's really important to get kind of that baseline right. one and, and, and then compare it, you know, and they really don't recommend doing those too often. Um, you know, every five, eight years, something like that. I mean, you could get them more often, I guess, if you had a doctor, you know, uh, write that for you. Um, but, um, but yeah, so it's, you kind of have to wait that one out and it doesn't show the soft plaque. So while I think it's useful to kind of know and get your assessment of how damaged has your arteries been like in the past and how they're doing, um, I think there are better, um, you know, short-term you know, markers to be taking. Um, but that, that one, um, I mean, there's, there's definitely research that shows that it is, um, certain things, uh, it is an indicator whether or not someone may have heart attacks or, or, um, further develop heart issues, um, a CAC score. So, so yeah. And what about like an echocardiogram, an EKG or a cardiac MRI? Yeah. I mean, um, like an echo, it's definitely going to help you with, with, with heart function or illustrate heart function as far as, especially with like a heart failure patient, you know, um, and, uh, or someone who's just had a heart attack and, and their recovery and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I think those things are, you know, they're, they're useful, but I, I don't know. I kind of have this, um, not aversion, but this hesitation when it comes to testing. Cause I think that, you know, we humans like to quantify everything. And, and I know that there are, you know, the buyer hackers out there. And I think that that's really interesting, all the information that they get and what, what I've learned, particularly from biohackers and things um, is really interesting. But I think for the average person, it can it get quite overwhelming. And I don't think that any test is going to tell like blood tests or imaging or, or functional tests is going to tell us if we're healthy or not. Um, and sometimes we let them tell us if we're healthy or not. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that's a, a good path uh, to, to follow. I mean, blood tests and, and different things can definitely tell us if there's something really wrong um, that we should intervene with right away. And that's, that's one use of them. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay attention to blood work. And I always look at blood work with clients and everything, but I, I feel that there's this overemphasis on it, especially when we're, you know, we're just on the outside looking in trying to understand this very complex biological ecosystem that is the human body. I don't think that, you know, taking, um, taking an image or taking um, a sample like of the blood or a biopsy of, of one tissue in the body is going to give us a, an assessment of if we're healthy or not, um, especially if it's one snapshot in time, because the body's always changing, like literally minute by minute, it's changing. Um, how that's supposed to give us an overall um, assessment of, of health and tell us if we're doing good or doing bad, they can be helpful. And I always look at them and I just told you what I think is, is helpful to look at. Um, but I wouldn't go like as far as like these advanced imaging systems, like an echo or a EKG and everything, unless, unless you're trying to investigate something you have as a symptom, you know, like if you're trying to figure something out, then that can be useful. Um, but in the meantime, the things I talked about, you know, those, the things that measure those three imbalances, those are the things that prevent us from having to, to think about even doing further investigation with these heavier um, scans and tests and things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great answer. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where someone like you as as a practitioner and clinician can help people navigate um, some of these things as well. Um, great. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your time. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm going to be re-listening to this one a couple of times. Um, <laughs> where can people find the book and find out more about you? Yeah, my, uh, my website is resourceyourhealth.com. Um, and my books are on there and, uh, my, uh, uh, blog is on there. I do my, my health coaching is on there. If people want to work with me, they can do so through there. My books are on Amazon and on the publisher's website and books a million. So if people don't want to use Amazon, they can find it elsewhere too. Um, 
And then I'm on social media at uh, Dr. Stephen Hussey, Dr. Stephen Hussey, um, on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. If people want to reach out to me there, they can do that uh, as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll have links to all of that in the show notes and really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered? Or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.